Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And um, I'll just give you who I am to a certain degree. Uh, I'm Colette Jordan, was Colette Redmond. Um, and as Theo Dorgan said, I never left Cork, I just live elsewhere. Uh, I went to live elsewhere in Dublin in 1973. Um, 50 years, I don't know where that went to really, but um, I went to, at that stage I went to work in AIB. I would say the reason I went to work in AIB was because I played hockey. And at that stage, if you played any sport in, you know, around the country, you, you, the banks were delighted to see you. I went to Min, uh, Maynooth University then as a mature student and graduated in history and classics. And I was very fortunate to be offered a position of research officer in the Centre for the Study of Historic Irish Houses and Estates in the Department of History in Maynooth. That was immediately after, I, was, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. This centre was just being launched by Professor Terence Dooley, who's now head of department in Maynooth. So the journey began. I've had the, the pleasure of gaining access to many private family papers, letters, diaries, and I've mainly worked on the Dukes of Leinster, the Leinster Fitzgerald papers. Um, I've, their, their family have just been so kind to me in Oxfordshire and in Ireland uh, in giving me access to the, their wonderful private papers. Many of them they didn't even realise they had. We just had fun in the, in the cellars of their house. Um, I've also had the pleasure of researching the history of Castle Hyde uh, for Michael and Neil Flatley and their family. Again, had great fun bringing people who had worked in Castle Hyde back uh, to the house. Michael Flatley and Neil were there that day, and we interviewed them all day long on their, their uh, workings in the house. Since I retired from Maynooth, I've worked privately on the social history of some houses in Ireland and in the UK. Um, Prince Khaled Abdullah, who just died during the year, uh, he was a great, he, the owner of the famous Frankel uh, horse. He has a wonderful stud farm in um, Kilcullen in Kildare. I worked on the history of that, New Abbey Farm, and uh, then uh, on one of his estates in Gloucestershire in England, the Escort Estate. Again, we're in England, they're lucky. This family, the Escort family, had owned this house for 700 years. And um, all you have to do really in, in that area of the Tetbury, it's a beautiful little place, go around the churches and all the history of the families are really on, on the church walls. And I'm preparing a talk for in the new year now on the historic Irish house as a family home. And sometimes I think I have neglected to point out the fact that these were family homes. We're inclined to look at them as them and us, but they, they, the people who lived there, both upstairs and downstairs, had feelings like every single one of us. So I will try to give my view of the servants in some of the big houses in Ireland and the UK. And we must look at big houses as being quite different from the more modest townhouses. I've had the pleasure, as I say, of uh, researching the, the papers of the um, Fitzgerald family in their family home in Oxfordshire. I went down to the cellar and I, as you can see the table, this is one of the first days I was there and we were just bringing up stuff that they didn't even know they had and we were t it, was, it was a dream really to, to go through all this stuff. That was the old dowager there and, and her lovely granddaughter Hermione. Um, I've looked at the, the, as I say, I looked at the Fitzgeralds, the connection um, through the family connection, or perhaps a house that the Fitzgeralds were known to have visited. I've also looked at the diaries of other big houses in Ireland and compared their household books, their diaries, their recipe books, um, and their general correspondence to try and see how the role of the servants might have changed over the years. And my work really is, spans from the middle of the 18th century to the beginning really of the 20th century when the role of the servant and indeed the age of the big house living was coming to an end at that stage. Again, I have based my research primarily on indoor staff and that unfortunately excludes many of the temporary staff who would have been in, employed at various times. I found that the records for temporary staff are few and far between as they're not usually named in any of the wages lists. Um, 
of the full-time servants. They don't appear in any census re uh, returns that I have found. But their role has to be recognised in any paper dealing with servants, because the big house could not have survived without the availability of casual and part-time labour, as the needs of the big house was constantly changing. What with events in family life, social activities and guests, seasonal activities and also family travels. Because to keep a permanent staff to cope with peak demand would have been impractical and uneconomical as resident staff were quite expensive to maintain. Also many permanent staff would have guarded their positions uh, and perhaps refused to take some of the more menial jobs. So we acknowledge that outside help was used for, for, at many times. We also acknowledge that a huge amount of servants were employed outdoors. I haven't really gone into those, but we do. We have to say on an estate, particularly maybe like the, one of the Fitzgerald's estates in Carton in, in um, Maynooth, or Kilkay Castle they also owned, or their summer house in Frascati in Black Rock. They would have... Um, they would have uh, as I say, used all those, those servants. Now, if we look at images, images for, um, of servants, in, there was a wonderful exhibition in the Yorkshire Country House, and the brochure of Castle, Castle Howard states, the history of servants is rather like the study of black holes. Both are known to have existed, but it is not easy to identify either. So here we have this image. I find this image a bit disturbing because I just think that it, it, they're silhouettes. So it's really just giving an image of their work. It's not giving an image of the people at all. And if you compare it, to, you know, the silhouettes just define the occupation of the person. They're depicted, as you can see, as housekeepers, parlour maids, governesses, in contrast to the... the um, the, the ladies who lived upstairs, so they had their beautiful paintings. Whereas most of the, as I say, the images of the servants in, in that particular exhibition were just a, um, as silhouettes. So as I say, it portrayed their work and not the person themselves. Now there is one wonderful image, and it's in the Tate Gallery in London. It's uh, by William Hogarth, painted about 1755, and it's called The Heads of six of Hogarth's servants. As I say, it's in the Tate. And here the, the artist, William Hogarth, is using his servants. This would have hung in his studio. So if people were coming in to commission a, a painting from him, he, he had this as, as um, just an example in his studio. And it's considered, it, quote, as the single, single most important image of servanthood. And I think when you look at it, it, it depicts really the seven ages of man. You see from the very youngest to the oldest. As I say, it would have hung in his artist's studio. Some have argued that the positioning of so many in a, in a narrow space shows that he unconsciously expressed their inferior rank. But others have suggested that maybe it's more democratic, that they all hold the same rank here, that you don't see the, the, the smaller ones as you would in the house, in the hierarchy of service, servants in the house. So as I say, this is, this is a wonderful um, uh, image that we do have servants, not in their place of work, but, but as an artist's studio. One of the quotes that has said that the images of these forgotten people speak as directly over the centuries as do the images of the wealthy and the celebrated. More directly, perhaps, since they are presented without flattery and without conceit." Unquote. Some of the portraits show the relationship between the master and mistresses, and very often this was a very close relationship from the letters I've written. If you think of in in our National Gallery in Dublin, you have the lovely Vermeer with the lady at the writing desk and her lady's maid in the background. So it seems to be a very close connection between them. Others that I have found, this is, if any of you go to um, Lissadell in Sligo, this lovely painting is on the wall of the dining room. Uh, this man's name is Thomas Kilgallen, 
He was the butler in, in Lissadell. This was painted in about 1908 by Casimir Markovich, uh, the husband of Countess Gorbuth. And Carton would have been a little unusual in that they had this, I found this painting actually when I was over in England. It's the, um, the servant of colour with the, the pony. Uh, it was in the collection of the Fitzgerald family up to 2006, I think they sold it. And this hung, we know that this hung in an inventory. At one stage, people were trying to argue that this was Tony Small, who was the man who came back from the American War of Independence with Lord Edward Fitzgerald. But in fact, I found it on um, an inventory of the paintings in Carton in um, 1772. So this, is, this would have been 10 years before Lord Edward would have gone to, to uh, America. So I th unfortunately I have to dispel that uh, theory. And a little, uh, another watercolour that I found over in Oxfordshire, where the, the present Duke of Leinster lives, I found this lovely little watercolour, I would say done possibly by a member of the family. And this painting is drawn in the, in the watercolour. It's a plan of the green drawing room in Carton. And this painting is included in it. This is between the uh, um, Alan Ramsey's and the Joshua Reynolds. So it is nice to see this painting in, in the, the inventory. And um, servants of colour would often have been found in royal households or in uh, noble households, in, in, particularly in England, from about the late 17th century. Uh, they were often included in family portraits, but it's very rare to see one uh, just depicted alone like this. The number of servants, the number of servants at any one time would have depended on, it would have depended on the size of the house, the size of the family, um, the whereabouts of the family would have determined if there was a full complement of staff. If the family was away, especially for an extended period, perhaps during the London season, then the house would be, they used to call it, put to sleep, and only a skeleton staff at that stage would have been in residence. Also, if a large number of guests were present, then staff numbers would have to be increased, and extra hands would have been hired on a short-term basis, uh, to meet the demand. But also remember, many of the guests would bring their own servants with them. So you would have, all these uh, servants then would have to be accommodated in these houses. Some of the letters talk about that there was an army of servants uh, in Carton at one stage. Another one says, uh, in one of Emily's letters to her sister, she says, there are servants without end in this house. Um, and in the papers of the Leslie family in Glasslock, we're told that they have brought, quote, squads of servants to London. And I think um, comparing records of lifestyle both here and in England, Carton in, in Maynooth had probably about 100 indoor staff in the middle of the 18th century. Now, please remember that Emily, the lady I showed you in the beautiful uh, Joshua Reynolds earlier on, she had 19 children with her husband, and then after he died, she married uh, the tutor. That's another story. And she had three further children with him. Her, her, she had originally come from Goodwood, glorious Goodwood, I'm sure anyone who's interested in racing. Uh, she was the Duke of Richmond's daughter. Uh, beautiful, beautiful house down in Chichester, and they had a very similar, they would also have about 100, 100 indoor staff. And some of, the, some of the staff would move with the family. So when this family moved into Leinster House, was their townhouse, so the staff would move with them. They also had Frascati House, as I say, near Black Rock in Dublin. This is where I was talking to somebody earlier about how they were trying to keep their children um, free from sicknesses. And just because they had money didn't, didn't help them in that regard. And they were very new in there, the, the, the mistresses were very new in looking at sea bathing and um, fresh air. You know, this is, this is 1760 and they're talking about going in, we talk now about sea bathing during COVID. Well, they were at it, as I say, in about 1760. They also obviously travelled to their London house. 
But keep in mind, too, that Dublin as a city went into a decline after the Act of Union, 1801, and that many of the big house owners were now spending much more time in England. So you see that, you know, at that stage, the, the amount of servants in their records are changing, you know, are, are declining all the time, particularly after the, after the Act of Union. Dublin, as I say, just went into decline. We see, you can't really see it here now, but these are some of the, the census records. This is going on a little bit earlier, 1901. Um, this just, they just have eight servants in Carton at this stage. There were just two, Lord Frederick, who was not the Duke, and his sister, uh, all from huge families. This was part of their downfall because they had to pay off all these people. And we see from their, their the, I'll just read it out to you there, the footman, and again, I think it's interesting, uh, Church of England. Uh, now, the second footman was Catholic. This would have been very unusual at that stage. The housekeeper, Church of England. The housemaid's Presbyterian, Church of Ireland. Still room maid, Church of England. Scullery maid, Presbyterian. Kitchen maid, Catholic. So you'll find that religion played a part in, in the hierarchy of the servants. Um, none of them were married, they could all read and write. If I look at Abbey Leakes, I also compared it, and they have eight servants also. And the, the, the other one, uh, 1911, again, it shows that the servants again are gone, gone down completely. There's uh, the laundry man is Catholic, the butler, the, in this case it was unusual because the butler was married. So obviously the, the houses were having to accommodate the changing times of servants. Uh, this is the beginning of the 20th century. And the servant world seemed to be a very self-contained, a circular uh, system where servants moved quite regularly. And the most tedious task was the acquisition and the retention of honest, efficient and loyal, loyal servants. In one letter in the 18th century, one of the mistresses complains that, quote, the government of servants is a full-time job. And some of the upper servants had great powers, and the trick really was to decide early on whether you were going to manage a servant or whether you were going to be managed by him. This was, this was the, 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 the dynamics that were going on all the time. Many employers considered that their servants were beholden to them, and one letter says, quote, Mary had the temerity to put her own happiness before my convenience and she foolishly threw herself into the hands of a soldier without giving me the least notice. How dare she? <laughs> Another talks about the mutiny of servants in the house. So here you can see that, you know, they, weren't, they didn't cow down, especially in these big houses. And this, the, the servants moved for various reasons, for better wages, for promotion, for experience, sometimes to get married. But the ambitious servant really had to balance this movers, movement as against being seen, it was called short charactered. And the character was the written reference that was going to be passed on from a previous employer and was essential really for any decent servant to show his or her next employer. This household book, I know it says 1758, actually it's 1764. It was copied in, in, in about 1890 and they put the wrong date on it in, in 1890. But I found this book in the cellar, actually, and it is an extraordinary book of the rules of the house of, of, um, of the Duke of Leinster. He was the Marks of Kildare at that stage. The household books tells us that the Fitzgeralds were offering servants extra pay if they stayed five years, and they seemed to be very, very generous employers. The household book, as I say, it's 113 pages, uh, compiled, it's between 1764-1773, and it, it gives the instructions for all the servants, the butler, the steward, the, it gives the timetables for all the meals, the quantities of food that are to be served in the, servant, in the steward's hall and in the servant's hall, the wages, how silver is to be cleaned, and very often uh, in big houses, the follow-up of a reference or a character was left to one of the senior servants, such as the steward. And they would have had a list of questions, and uh, one of the questions, it, it's like, um, uh, they're, they put, as I say, all the rules are written in this book, and these are the questions to be asked for a lady's maid. 
Is she trustworthy, sober and honest? Is she quick and obliging and kind in illness? Is she a handy dressmaker, a careful packer and a handy traveller? Again, very important if they were moving. Has she a good temper or is she easily irritated? Is she thoroughly discreet and not inclined to make friends all over the place? And that seemed to be very important to them. They hated the idea of their servants gossiping. Or is she in good health and has she good eyesight? Do you know if she is engaged to be married? So this is, I mean, talk about being precise about what they wanted. Uh, one thing about this book, any disputes, and it, again, it's all recorded in this wonderful book, they are to be brought to the attention to, to, of the Duke or the Duchess. So definitely in the 18th century, the ladies of the house had just as much power in this house, definitely, and it seemed to be in others as, as the, 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 the men of the house. As I say, like their English uh, countryside, the, it, their English counterparts, no big house in Ireland could fun function without a large army of servants. It appears from our records that Irish big houses, that most of the upper servants would have been recruited in England. This is very understandable as most of the big house owners here also had property in England and travelled there and to the continent on a very regular basis. All servants who had contact with the family, certainly in this case, would have either been Protestant or Presbyterian. Uh, Methodists, in one of the letters it says Methodists, and I, I hope I'm not uh, insulting anybody here, Methodists were often overlooked as it was felt that they needed too much time to worship. So they, but definitely no Roman Catholics were in, allowed near the children. Many of the English wives who came to marry and live in Ireland would have brought some of their own personal servants with them, and recruitment was done mainly through word of mouth, letters between family constantly asking about the availability of cooks and housekeepers, butlers. Also, it must be remembered, there were actually professional training schools in the UK and in, in Ireland in 1827. The Dublin Society reports on a scheme for the improvement and the encouragement of, of servants. Um, again, all Protestant. It wasn't for Catholics, just for Protestant. Uh, one in Belfast, 1836, the Society for the Encouragement and Reward of Good Conduct in Female Servants. Sometimes I find it very hard to say this. Um, it, as I say, institutions such as the Protestant Service Registration Office were set up in the middle of the 19th century in Dublin to train Irish Protestant girls, quote, of good moral character to go into the world to earn their bread in honourable independence, unquote. Now, some of the more menial jobs, such as scullery maids, laundry maids, uh, may have been given to Catholics, but these jobs would have kept them out of contact with the family. And if we look at various ways were put into operation to ensure that the family would not have contact with many of their servants, or even to see them. We know that in Rockingham, this, this vaulted tunnel in Strokestown, they had to go back and forward through the series of tunnels, hidden pathways. Likewise, there's Castle Cool, it's up near Enniskillen. There's this magnificent stone vaulted tunnel. It's four metres high and 50 metres long, uh, which connects the east end of the house to the kitchen so that the, the, the workers there could go completely unseen to the family themselves. And then the invention of the bells in the mid 18th century was important as it ensured that servants would not have to loiter in corridors within earshot of the family rooms and could be called on demand from the basement or the attic, wherever they were. Henceforth, rules were laid down about servants not straying into family areas except on business. In some of the letters it says that if seen, the servants were told to stand still and look at the floor, or even to turn to the wall. And they had to stay away from windows in order so that they would not be seen from outside. Then, as I say, a system of bells was used in the servant hall 
uh, showed where and when the service was needed. And there were various elaborate codes that are in some of their, their household books, both here and in the UK, for a, house, for a housemaid you ring once, for the footman ring twice. And I suppose this invention probably cemented the idea of the upstairs and downstairs divide more than any other because it kept the servants out of what we call the polite space. The, the indoor staff were under the control of the butler and the housekeeper and the clerk of the kitchen. And from the family records of Carthen, these included the valet, the under butler, footman, the steward's room boy, hall boy, hall porter, uh, dairy maids, laundry maids, kitchen maids, coachman, post boy, clock winder, chimney cleaner, parcel man, and all their instructions of how to deal with them is in this book. At the next level then there was the governess, nurse, the nursery maid, the tutor, and these positions were nearly family. They, they some actually ate at the table with the family, and it, this really brings us to the huge uh, issue of hierarchy among servants. And many of the complaints uh, of cruelty by the under servants were against the upper servants and not against the master or mistresses. So there was this hierarchy of servants. We don't find in many of the, even the servants' uh, records, we don't find particularly, uh, and I'll talk personally about the Fitzgeralds, they did have a, a, a great relationship, a fairness, I will say, with their servants. Um, Emily, her, the first Duchess of Leinster, she has left just a mountain of correspondence, thankfully. And she deals with her problem of finding cooks and nurses. Many of the servants are named in her letters. She talks about interviewing a gardener for a job in Carton. She offered him, uh, this is about 1770, she offered him 30 pounds per annum. But the gardener had his own conditions. He wanted to bring his wife with him from England and he wanted to be allowed to have beer in his house. She also speaks of a housekeeper, Mrs. Clark, uh, she says, who is sensible, noble, genteel. She mentions another servant, uh, she doesn't mention his name, and, um, no, a, a lady, she, she doesn't mention her name, but she said, quote, she did not have the pecked nose, right look of a housekeeper. Whatever she means by that. She raves about one of the footmen, Philip. I don't know what was going on with Emily and Philip. But Mrs. Clark, as I say, seems to be a very favourite housekeeper because when, when Mrs. Clark died in 1790, all the family are devastated at her loss. And the letters, are, are, the letters about these servants are uh, scattered right through the estate papers. The Fitzwilliam letters, the great Fitzwilliam estate, they show too that they're having a problem in rec recruiting staff. Now, I have to apologise in advance for some of the language used in this letter. Uh, but uh, the, this is a letter about 1750, he says, we are sorry we can't have the man Mrs. Bull mentioned to us. She obviously, somebody had recommended this lady to them, or this man, or this lady, I beg your pardon, because she thought he was so fit for us. We should be glad you could help us to find good cookmaids, because here they are just sluts or whores or thieves or drunken beasts, and we dare not bring them in. So there were being, some of them were being very, as I say, judgmental about the people. Another one, this is in the UK, um, the Earl of Stamford, this is a, about 1810. Quote, I have engaged Philip Osgood at 70 guineas per annum for you. He has just sent me a specimen of his handwriting, which I think tolerable. Philip is rather marked with the smallpox but is, in my opinion, certainly a respected and genteel servant. So, in, in later years, we come to governess. This, this is uh, Hermione Fitzgerald. She was the fifth Duchess of uh, Leinster, the last to reside in Carton House. And her letters, she's writing very regularly to the de Vices in Abbey Leaks. They were great friends and families were going back and forth. She, she would be visiting Evelyn de Vici. Actually, Evelyn de Vici's letters are all in the UK, um, but they're extraordinary letters. I have her letters back, but uh, in the UK they have uh, Evelyn de Vici's letters. But she talks, um, 
Hermione is writing to Evelyn de Vici and she's, she's explained that she's finding it very hard to retain governesses for these two little boys. Uh, she says that her boys, quote, like the governess, but they will not obey her. And in another letter she asks, she asks if anybody knows of a governess who might like, quote, spirited young boys. I'd say they're brats, you know. <laughs> uh, that's Morris and Desmond. Unfortunately, both died before they could inherit um, the dukedom, which left a lot of problems. Some of the letters then show that the character reference seems to have broken down. For example, the Sutherland Papers in 1850 contain a letter stating, quote, Resolved to change a footman, recently sent to me with a glowing character of which it appears to me is totally unworthy. Being pre he being preeminently thick-headed. People acquire and get rid of servants just as they do horses. Merits greatly exaggerated, defects concealed, ages falsified. No one wants to keep them if bad or unsafe, and they will tell any lie to put them on to other people. Again, the household book of the Dukes of Leinster. This is, is one of the, the pages there. He, t he t shows that he's trying to retain staff. He said, uh, um, each housemaid, footmaid, uh, steward room man, pantry boy, and lamplighter, and all other lower servants shall be paid at the ex um, after five years' service one entire year's wages over and above. So here he's going to he's agreeing to pay. If they stay with him for five years, he'll give them an extra pay. And wages for servants varied very widely. Arthur Young, on his tour of Ireland in 1780, suggests that the wages for servants in Ireland were about 30% below the wages in, the, in England. Some were not paid at all, and they only enjoyed board and lodging. Many servants were paid on an annual basis, and not, uh, sometimes not in advance. They were paid after a year. And some then, it shows that they're trying to borrow during the year, so that by the time their year is up, they have nothing left. Um, the Fitzgeralds, according to their household book, were paying their servants on a quarterly basis. And in 1772, the rules of the, uh, the footman state eight pounds a year wages to be p called for and paid after the first quarter, 30 shillings a year for leather breeches, shoes, stockings, four pounds a year instead of veils, and V-A-I-L-S. And nothing contributed more, really, to the independence of um, male servants than the system of tipping, which was known as veils. Visitors and departing guests from any of the, many of the big houses were, uh, they say in one of the letters, obliged, I would say blackmailed, actually, would probably be a better word for it. They had to donate the lined up footmen and butler. Many of the upper servants also expected Christmas boxes from their employer and regular guests. And in the early 18th century, veils had become the chief source of income for many of the male upper servants, in many cases doubling their wages. It was a huge problem then for the aristocracy, as many felt that they couldn't visit their friends because they would have been expected to tip the line as they were leaving. Many reports tell of a butler who would advise some guest, oh no, the master is not at home, even if he was, because this man mightn't have been as generous maybe the last time he visited, so suddenly the master was not at home. Another that I found, uh, it was a refusal, to, this man sent a refusal to a house, he was invited to go, and the, the letter said, my lord, I am not rich enough to take soup with you. Obviously he couldn't afford to pay the tipping when he was there. Women servants had less opportunity to receive veils, but they sometimes were rewarded after possibly a game, game of cards. Card games with women were the opportunity for the butler um, to be rewarded. He would supply the cards and the candles. Um, Dr. Patricia McCarthy, she's written extensively on uh, life in the big house, and she explains that in um, the crusade to abolish veils, the giving of veils, began in Scotland in about 1770, and then it extended south to London. So really the heyday of the footman was over at this stage. 
but it resulted in serious riots in London at the time, particularly by the footmen. They were the people who had most to lose here. Many of the employers in Ireland agreed to abolish the system and the marks of Kildare's records in the household book dated 1770. He says, quote, in consideration of bales, I will not permit for the future to be received in any of my houses upon any account whatsoever from company lying in there, but I will compensate them, my staff for a year. So to compensate for it to the housekeeper, and to the cook and the confectioner, he's giving an extra five pounds a year. To the, uh, the groom of chambers, he's given three pounds a year. Gent of the horse, two pounds. He doesn't make any allowances for the under servants. And he does say, if any of them who choose to go, they can go. So he's just, he's um, rewarding the upper servants. Here we can see, as I say, it's only the upper servants are included. But this is rectified in, in seven years later when another uh, uh, entry states, four pounds a year to be paid to the footman in lieu of bales at the end of one year's service. So even though, even though pay for servants in Ireland was, was less, the Fitz, less than in England, the, the Fitzgerald seemed to have rewarded their staff better than in other country houses. And I've looked at a few different country houses in 1884, the servants, this is some of the servants that were in Carton, um, the house steward is getting 100 guineas per an annum. His counterpart in Kilkenny at that stage is getting 47. So you can see that there's a difference here. Um, again, I think you can see from um, the, their surnames, you can see maybe John Russell, Patrick, Huss, you know, the, these would possibly be local. All the others possibly would have come from England or from, uh, from other families. The accommodation for servants is another problem. Um, we, have, we have difficulty really in, say, in uh, accommodation. And yes, in some big houses there were servants' quarters, um, servants' blocks. I also think it's, and I'll just tell you a small little anecdote not to compare the times then with our times now. I'll talk about a lovely, a great friend of mine in Dublin, a lovely Jewish man. He wrote the history of the Jewish community in Dublin, Mr. Nick Harris. And his parents had come from Lithuania in about 1890 with, with his grandmother. His grandmother and his mother never spoke English. They all spoke Hebrew. And they lived in Greenville Terrace off the South Circular Road because it was right beside the synagogue. And um, Mr. Harris had, there were seven children, his parents and a grandmother, and they lived in a two-bedroomed house on Greenville Terrace, right beside the, the synagogue. And I was driving him around the area one day, a few years before, he lived to be uh, 96. We were driving down around the area and there was a for sale sign on his house. So I said, oh, Mr. Harris, we'll go and see your house. And there was a man there, a young man with a child in his arms. And I introduced Mr. Harris and I said, this had, this had been his home. And this young man said, um, well, we absolutely love the house, but my wife is pregnant with our second child, so we have to leave. And I thought of Mr. Harris with his seven and three, ten in the same house. So that's what I'm saying about the servant accommodation. We have to judge, not judge it on today's. We know that there was a servant area in Leinster House, that's documented. Uh, we know that there was a servant area in uh, Frascati in Black Rock. Some of the outdoor staff definitely lived in the stables block, that's in the house, that's in the house book. Um, the indoor staff, we think, lived on the top floor of Carton and also in the basement. There were some sleeping areas. We know that there were pulled down beds um, in near the kitchen and in the plate rooms. The household also, this book records unwanted advances in the plate made the rooms and writes one of the instructions for the butler. This is 1764. He said, this is the instructions by the uh, Duke and Duchess of Leinster to the butler. He must not by any means allow the pantry to be used as a meeting or a gossiping place for the under servants. He must not let the plate made be used ill or rudely. He must not admit strange servants or footmen to dress in the plate maid's pantry. 
So you can see that all this life is going on downstairs, but I think this book shows me that these, these are people who were looking out for their servants. I know not everybody was. Again, we can see, it, again in Carton and the Fitzgeralds, the servants who were eating in Carton. This is 1760, and this is uh, the, the instructions. Dinner to be, this is for the stewards' hall first. Dinner to be at the on the table at exactly four o'clock to consist of one or two dishes of roast or boiled with garden things. Meats such as mutton, pork, steaks or veal, which is killed on the estate. Every Sunday to have plum pudding or any other type of pudding. Not to have more than one and a half pounds of meat per person per day. The supper and the breakfast to be such meat that might be left over from dinner or cold, and as they like, added some potatoes and any kind of garden stuff, cheese and eggs. And even in the servants' uh, hall, again, at one o'clock, the dinner to be on the table, boiled beef, cabbage, roots, every Sunday to have um, beef roasted with pudding, every Thursday to have boiled mutton with turnips, if convenient, boiled pork, roots, pudding and potatoes instead of mutton. And again, for the servants, the pieces of meat for this table, not to exceed one and a half pounds of meat a day. So they're eating, they're eating good quantities here. For some, supper, this is now where it gets a bit difficult for us ladies. For supper, some bread and a quarter pound of cheese to each, but the men are to get a pat of butter. None for the ladies, I'm afraid. But then there's another one, and the rations, three pints of beer daily for men, and one and a half pints of beer daily for women. This is every day in the, in the servants' hall. Now, this is because the water was so bad that they, 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 they drank the, the beer instead. To understand some of the, the, the daily routine of the servants, we must contemplate the range of domestic tasks that we undertake in our own household. You know, the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry, the ironing, and then we have to multiply this. In addition, we must remember that uh, these servants are working in an age really before any modern technology. Their work was labour intensive, it took longer to, to perform, and occupied you know, many, many pairs of hands. If you just take a carpet being cleaned, now we want a vacuum clean over it. They had to take it out, bring it out, three or four to beat, the, beat it and things. This is, these domestic chores were performed in an, e in an era without electricity, no washing machines, spin dryers, running water, uh, cold, it could not be taken for granted. There was no scouring, cleaning agents, rubber gloves, aerosols, and much of the time actually was spent cleaning the cleaning in instruments that they were inventing all the time. Um, Mrs. Beaton, she uh, illustrated at one stage 12 different types of brush and broom for various tasks. They, Victor they also pioneered um, a gadget, uh, it's in another one of these uh, household books, a knife cleaning gadget. Now, although the, the problem is that to, get, to put the knife cleaning, uh, to put the knives into this gadget, you nearly had to clean them first. So there was really no no labour saving. But nothing was wasted, and there there is uh, talks of putting tea leaves. Tea leaves were shaken on carpets so that they spread over the carpets, and they helped um, to uh, absorb the dust when they were sweeping. The different positions. The housekeeper always referred to as Mrs. by the other servants, whether she was married or not, always referred to as Mrs. Uh, her job was to maintain order and to direct mainly the female staff. We know of Mrs. Clark and Carton, also Mrs. Lynch, and they seem to be quite friendly with the family in the correspondence. They're mentioned in a very friendly way. The lady's maid, again, very close to the mistress of the house, often disliked by the other members of the staff, they helped the mistress, you know, to take care of her boudoir, to help with dressing. Um, she had to be pleasant, to be, she had to be able to read and write, speak well, she had to be neat. Um, her tasks were not as demanding as others, but she had to be at, on beck and call all the time. Uh, one of the, we have some of the ladies' maids' letters, and they feared getting old, as very often their mistresses preferred younger girls um, 
these ladies' maids, they were usually in their 20s, uh, but her, her special talents set her apart from the other staff, and she was, even though she was only in her 20s, she would have been treated really like a senior in the house. The cook then, the cooks, as I say, she cooked for upstairs in very large houses, very often there was a second cook for the servants. The cook would meet the mistress and, and discuss the menus. Soups were usually uh, made the previous day. And dinner could be up to 10 courses. Very often towards the end of the um, 19th century, some of the records show that the, the, uh, the cooks were male. Not, not so much in England, but certainly in Ireland that seems to have come in. They also obviously directed the preserving of the fruits and the jellies, the pickles, whatever was in season. The nanny then, the nanny was an important, uh, she looked after the eldest son and the other nursery maids then looked after the, the more junior children. She was often revered and loved as she spent more, child, more time with the children. Having said that, some records show that, particularly with this family, parental visits were much warmer and more intimate than was supposed before we've gone through many of these, these records. Uh, a nanny very often served two or three generations. In Emily, she's writing to her old nanny who's still living in Goodwood and saying how happy she is in um, Carton. A nanny too would have to know of ailments and health issues, cures, things like that. A governess, very often, the uh, very often a daughter of a local clergyman. Again, they were very anxious as to who had contact with their children. Then the housemaids. There were various positions, parlour maids, chamber maids, laundry maids, all under the supervision of the housekeeper. These made, they, they maintained, the, they lit the fires, they brought water for bathing and for washing, removed the dirty water, cleaned the chamber pots, made the beds swept the ashes, their work went on and on. Very often they started, at, um, they started at about 6 in the morning and they finished at about 10, 10 30 at night. And at one stage Emily is saying in the letters of Carton, this is 1760, that there's only one laundry maid, God help her, in Carton because Emily says that it is definitely too much and she's trying to organise other servants to help her and of course they're sticking, no that's not my job, I'm not going there. Uh, we must, when we see something like that, we have to think that possibly there was, a, a, it doesn't say it in the records, that maybe they were bringing it to the, the town of Maynooth and getting their laundry done there. I mean, it's just hard to believe that one laundry maid could, could do all that. Um, if the house had a, uh, oh yeah, these are the, as I say, this is the laundry room, I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like. And this is the poor kitchen maid, I mean, she's just, worked off her feet, really. The butler, the butler then, the distinguished figure, always a very imposing presence. He was always addressed as Mr. And his work depended on really how big the house was. It, um, in smaller houses, he hired and dismissed the lower staff. And he had to make sure that all issues were addressed and that the house ran smoothly. If the house contained a plate room with the silver, he had to ensure that that was securely locked. And we have records of poor little uh, laundry boys or something being locked in the plate room at night, you know, to sleep in the plate room to, to, to look after this. They were expected, to, and even the butler or the footman, they were expected to sleep close to the plate room for security. He could also be asked to carve meat, re remove the covers from the dishes. And in some, er some houses, he served wine. And he announced when the drawing room was ready, his last job at night always closed doors, windows locked, plate secured, and ensure that all the fires were, were um, out. The valet then was the master's personal servant. He had much prestige in the house. He uh, had to have all the correct clothing ready, attend to the shaving needs, iron his shoelaces at one stage in one of the letters. He had to iron the shoelaces, la shoelaces and wash the coins, if you don't mind. He always travelled with the master, and very often he would have been promoted to a butler or steward. Then we have the tutor. Uh, Mr. Bowl was the tutor in Carton for many, many years, and he 
travelled, he was originally from Switzerland, he travelled with the young boys. They went to Eton as seven, eight-year-old, and their tutor would have gone with them to Eton. He also would have gone with them on their grand tour, uh, when they did the grand tour of um, Europe. His wife, Mrs. Bowl, she held a position also of a nursery maid. And why I mention this man, Mr. William Ogilvy, he was the tutor. He, worked, he lived mainly in Black Rock in Dublin in the summer house. He went there for a lot of the summer. And when the Duke of Leinster died in 1766, this um, tutor married the Duchess of Leinster. And it caused, I mean, I found the newspapers from Paris from London, all talking about the absolute scandal of this, that she'd married a servant. Consternation. But um, it, they calmed down and eventually she went back to live in England and they had three more children. Um, the footman then, directly below the, the butler, it could be first footman, second footman. He, they used to, sometimes they were known as the running footmen, sometimes called tigers, and you can see that because of their yellow and black uniform. They would have uh, accompanied the mistress in her carriage when she was making house calls or when she was going shopping. And uh, they would polish the, the household plate and the copper. They'd wait at tables. The first footman would be responsible for the mistress. And then if there was a second footman, very often he would act as a valet, possibly to the eldest son. Uh, they, they did little or nothing, really. They, they, they announced visitors. They ran errands. They answered the drawing room. Uh, because they were very visible, they were expected to be very presentable. They were probably the most presentable of, of all the male servants. And there was an ideal height in one of the, the documents we found. There was an ideal height for footmen with a fine physique. And their, their livery for outdoors consisted of the, the ornate tailcoat, the knee breeches, stockings, white gloves, buckle shoes. Some of them powdered their hair. And for indoors, then, it was slightly less formal. So to conclude, though some maids and mistresses may have been difficult and exacting, the servants could also show their independence. And to say that they cowed down in submission is far from true. On the contrary, many seem to have been quite capable of securing their own interests and a reasonable standard of life. One of the articles written about servants says, quote, domestic servants was by no means the Cinderella of the occupations of the poor, unquote. So no matter how long the hours or how cold the floors, how hard the beds, most young recruits into the big house in Ireland had taken a step up in the world. Most started work at a lower rung of the ladder and gradually they were promoted to more senior roles if they showed aptitude and a willingness to work hard. Much of their wages were sent home to their families. Of course, everything changed in the 20th century and for very many reasons. There was an opportunity for mass employment in, after, uh, in factories and in offices, cheaper emigration, of course, to the States and from Britain to the colonies, and unfortunately many went to war. As well as better pay, far more freedom and a variety of experience was to be found elsewhere. It was probably only when the master and mistress realised that the days of plentiful servants were nearly at an end that they really realised their full worth. In the early 20th century, serious concessions were made to attract people into service. Better pay and condition, obviously labour, a saving uh, equipment, houses had to be servant friendly. And by the beginning of World War I, married couples actually were being welcomed, even with their children, into service. But the day of the unending supply of people willing to work long hours uh, were over, and the world of upstairs downstairs was never going to be the same again. Some of the, big, some of the reports of the big houses in the 1920s and 1930s show how, quote, standards had dropped, and many houses were now uh, perhaps had three or four staff. Many of the remaining butlers, I know I'm maybe making a generalisation there, they tended now to be old and probably a bit eccentric and probably addicted to a bit of whiskey or wine. There's a great story of a tea party in Blarney Castle following the death of Sir George Colthurst, 
the butler entered the room stark naked with a tea tray, and Lady Coulthurst went to him and, without making any fuss, suggested that they needed a little more sugar, and he just left. <laughs> and in the diary of Shane Leslie, he tells of a butler, I say again after wine tasting, he asked Lady Culloden to marry him. She said, of course, and, he, and told him to continue serving, and it was all forgotten about the next day. So how ironic that the new tourism, uh, that is the historic Irish house, and indeed the wonderful properties in the National Trust in Northern Ireland, so many of the visitors show far more interest in the lives of those who live below stairs rather than those who lived the charmed life upstairs. Perhaps because they realised that life below stairs was a hive of activity, home to a boisterous crowd of servants, many who thrived in this up to now hidden community where intrigue, where rivalry, secrets, laughter and sometimes love abounded. Thank you. Thank you.